Dr. Robert Vinoy, Old Testament History, Lecture Number 23. I pretty much concluded what I wanted to say about Genesis 15, although let me, before going further, read you a statement from Meredith Klein's book, By Oath Consigned. It is in connection with that smoking furnace that passed between the slain parts of the animal in the ratification rites of the covenant here in Genesis 15. On page 45 of By Oath Consigned, Klein says, Genesis 15 tells us of a covenant cutting and a theophany which Abraham witnessed amid darkness and horror, the only proper setting for this Old Testament Golgotha. There in the passage, God in the divided theophonic symbol of a smoking furnace and flaming torch between the dismembered creature, the mystery of the abandonment of the Son of God emerged before him. For what Abraham witnessed was the strange self-maldiction of the God of the covenant who would himself undergo the covenant curse by cutting asunder rather than fail to lead his servant into the promised fullness of the beatitude. He discusses this in much greater detail, but that is just a couple sentences from his treatment of it. That is, an insight into the passage that is helpful in not only understanding what's going on in the passage, but putting it into a, the larger context of Scripture. To go on with that passage, Genesis 15, in verse 18, you come back to the land aspect of the Abrahamic covenant. In verse 18 you read, quote, On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto your seed I have given the land, from the river Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, end quote. So the borders of the land are specified. If you go further in the Old Testament, you find that when Moses comes to the plains of Moab, where Israel's about to take the promised land, you read in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 7, quote, Turn you, and take your journeys, and go to the mountains of the Amorites, and unto all the places near thereunto, in the plain, in the hills, and in the vale, and in the south, and by the seaside, to the land of the Canaanites, and unto Lebanon, unto the great river, the river Euphrates, end quote. So you get those same boundaries repeated by Moses as promised to Abraham. That is the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy. It is repeated internally in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 11, verse 24. Then when Moses dies and Joshua follows him in leadership of the nation, bringing them into the land, you find in Joshua chapter 1, verse 4, quote, From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your border, end quote. So you get a repetition there as well. That promise was partially fulfilled under Joshua in the conquest. You read in Joshua chapter 13, verses 1 through 6, that the land was taken, that is, the land of Canaan. But at that point, concerning the territories, it says, quote, to the entrance of Hamath, end quote, which is quite far north. But as we read in Joshua chapter 13, verse 1, quote, there is much land to be possessed, end quote. In each of those tribal territories there remained a job to be done, even though the basic territory was controlled. So when you come to the first chapter of the book of Judges, you read about the various tribes, that Benjamin didn't drive out the Jebusites, Manasseh didn't drive out the inhabitants of the various places, Ephraim didn't drive out the Canaanites, Zebulun didn't, Asher didn't, the general picture is that they really didn't finish the job. It is not until the time of David when he places garrisons on the Euphrates in Second Samuel chapter 8 that you really get the fulfillment of that promise. Second Samuel chapter 8 verse 3 says, quote, David smote Hadezer, the son of Rehob, the king of Zobah, as he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates. And David took 
from him a thousand chariots and seven hundred horsemen, end quote, and so forth. He put garrisons in other places, which you read in Second Samuel chapter 8. When you go over to First Kings and Solomon succeeds David, you read in First Kings chapter 4, verse 21, quote, Solomon reigned over all the kingdoms from the river unto the land of the Philistines, and unto the border of Egypt they brought presents and served Solomon all the days of his life, end quote. Quote, the river, end quote, refers to the Euphrates River. If you go down to verse 24, you read, quote, For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, from Tifsa even to Gaza, end quote. Tifsa is a city on the Euphrates. So David reigned from Tifsa down to Egypt. It seems to me that that is a provisional fulfillment at that time of the promise to Abraham that he would occupy that territory. Of course, David didn't hold it, and Solomon, who inherited David's kingdom, was king at this point. The covenant is said to go back to Genesis 15. The borders are given in Genesis chapter 17, verses 7 through 8, where the land is referred to again. In the end of verse 8, it says that all the land of Canaan will be given, quote, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God, end quote. So the promise of the land as belonging to the descendants of Abraham will continue to be valid as long as the Abrahamic covenant is continuing to exist. It is coextensive with the Abrahamic covenant in verses 7 and 8 of Genesis chapter 17. There's an interesting reference in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 through 36, which says, quote, Thus saith the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, who divides the sea when its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me forever. End quote. A clear indication is, since the sun and the moon are not going to cease to shine, then Israel is not going to cease from being a nation before the Lord. As long as there is continuation of day and night, there will continue to be this nation, Israel, as God's people. So the continuance of Israel as a nation is linked to the creation ordinances of the rising and setting of the sun. If you go back to Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, you read, quote, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease, end quote, in connection with the covenant with Noah. So both the promise of the land and of the continuance of the nation is something that will continue on indefinitely into the future. That raises the question of how you relate the administration of the Abrahamic Covenant across the period of the Old and New Covenant. You really get into the issues of covenant theology with that. There is an overarching unity of the covenant of grace that is administered differently in the Old Testament economy than in the New Testament economy. That covenant remains perpetual as it crosses and transcends the testaments. The administration of it differs, and there you get into this question of the relationship between circumcision and baptism. And I would find baptism to be a counterpart to circumcision, continuing on. If you take Paul's statement that the middle wall of partition is wiped out and Jew and Gentile are now one in Christ, and those distinctions between male and female, master and slave, Jew and Gentile, are erased, there's a certain sense in which those distinctions no longer apply within the body of Christ in the new economy. But, on the other hand, there's another sense in which that distinction continues to exist. Even though you know man and woman are one in Christ, there is still a difference between a man and a woman. Even though Jew and Gentile are one in Christ, there can still be that distinction between those who are the seed of Abraham by the flesh and those who are not, who are 
spiritual seed. In that spiritual seed, we are all one, but in the physical seed, I believe there is still a distinction. All right, let's go on to Genesis chapter 17. That is the third passage pertaining to God's covenant to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, we read, And when Abraham was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Neither shall your name any more be called Avram, for your name shall be called Avraham. For a father of many nations have I made you. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come out of you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto you, and to your seed after you. And I will give unto you, and to your seed after you, the land wherein you are a sojourner, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Quote. What you have in chapter 17 is the covenant confirmed and renewed. It is initially represented in chapter 12, ratified in chapter 15, and confirmed and renewed here in chapter 17. This sort of repetition of material pertaining to the covenant is one of the things the source critics work with and say, quote, here we have duplications, end quote. And they ascribe Genesis 17 to the P document and Genesis 15 to the J document. J is more primitive, 17 is more sophisticated, at least in their view. And you have these duplications as a result of variant sources. But it requires nothing of that sort. It is just that the Lord is confirming these promises over and over to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 17 it says, quote, When Avram was 99 years old, end quote, this is 13 years after the birth of Ishmael. You read in the end of chapter 16, quote, Avram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. You remember Ishmael was born not of Sarah, but of Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar. Now, thirteen years had passed, and he still does not have a son by Sarah. It is twenty-four years since the original promise of the seed. If you go back to Genesis chapter 12, when he's ninety-nine years old, twenty-four years later, the Lord says, quote, Walk before me, be perfect, end quote. Quote, perfect, end quote, there, is not to be understood in the way we understand it as moral perfection, but living a wholesome life, being obedient to the Lord, and walking in faith before the Lord. He says, quote, I will make my covenant and will multiply you exceedingly, end quote. In verse 5, he elaborates, saying, quote, Your name won't be called Avram, but Avraham, end quote. The etymology or meaning of Avram, the short form, is somewhat disputed, but most feel that it is related to two factors, the Av, which means father, and Ram, which means, quote, be high, end quote, or, quote, exalted, end quote. So the idea would be the, quote, father exalted, end quote. The father, in that case, being what's termed in Hebrew names as theophoric. It is a reference to God. So God is exalted. God is the Father. God is exalted would be the meaning of the name, if it is a theophoric name, and if the first element refers to God. Avraham comes from Av and Raham. Raham meaning, quote, a great number, end quote so that the name becomes, quote, father of many, end quote. There, the father refers not to God, 
but to Abraham, so that his name is changed from Avram, God is exalted, to Abraham, quote, the father of many nations, end quote. So it is put in connection with his numerous offspring. Notice the statement in verse 6 that, quote, kings shall come out of him, end quote. The promised line is to have royalty developed within it. Of course, that becomes the theme that is picked up and elaborated on, not only in Genesis, but also later on in other places in the Old Testament. The fourth covenant, repetitive passage, is Genesis chapter 22, verses 17 through 18. Genesis 22 tells the story of the Lord's command to Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. This is after Isaac is born, the son of promise, and that is a real test of faith for Abraham, which we'll discuss later. But Abraham demonstrates his faith in that context, and when you get to verses 16 through 18, you read, quote, By myself I have sworn, end quote, saith the Lord, quote, For because you have done this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. End quote. So you have a reaffirmation in verses 17 and 18 of those central elements of the Abrahamic covenant, particularly, quote, In your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. End quote. The interesting thing is that that is enclosed with two statements. In verse 16, quote, Because you've done this thing, end quote, then at the end of verse 18, quote, And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice, end quote. That, quote, because, end quote, raises some difficult theological questions. How do you explain that, quote, because, end quote? is ultimately the promise of Christ contingent on the obedience of Abraham? Most commentaries don't discuss the, quote, because, end quote. You can look that up in most commentaries, and there's nothing there, which is often the case when you get to real tough questions. Commentaries don't help you there. But in Calvin's commentary, two-thirds of the way down, on page 13 of the class notes and page 572 of his commentary, volume 1, Calvin suggests that, quote, the language of these texts is intended to stimulate us to holy living by, by transferring our works and Abraham's. In this case, what properly belongs to his pure beneficence, end quote. Calvin's suggestion at least points us in the right direction. He says, quote, we must, of necessity, conclude that what is freely given is yet called the reward of works. End quote. Then later he says, quote, God pays nothing as a debt, but gives to his own benefits the title of a reward. End quote. It may appear that what Calvin is saying is a sort of a terminological solution. Quote, what is freely given is called the reward of works. God pays nothing as a debt, but gives his own benefits the title of a reward, end quote. That is, God's benefits are not exactly a reward. They are only so designated for motivation in our pursuit of godliness. While that may appear to be the case, and if the distinction is simply that of a label, Calvin is really suggesting that these texts propose that God actually took Abraham and his obedience up into the promulgation of the promise. And here is the important distinction. God does not do that in the sense of efficient cause or meritorious reward, but in the sense of a divinely ordained means of administration of the promise. In other words, Abraham's obedience is included in that divinely ordained means of administration of promise. It is not a meritorious cause. It is not an efficient cause. 
but it is included. Abraham's faithfulness, then, was the fruit of the grace of God operative in his life, which did not in any way merit the reward of the promise, but which, nevertheless, was an integral feature in the promulgation of the promise. Certainly God's election of Abraham and the promise to him preceded his response of faith and obedience. It goes back years and years at this point. But Abraham's election did not preclude, in the sense of obviating, the importance of his response. Rather, it included it as an inevitable accompaniment of the working of divine grace in his life. That seems to be an attempt to explain the connection here between Abraham's obedience and this promulgation of promise, as it is stated in the text. So in that sense, I think Calvin is correct when he says, quote, God pays nothing of a debt, but gives of his own benefits the title of a reward, end quote. It is God who is working in Abraham and enabling him to respond in faith, even to the point of his test of faith in Genesis chapter 22. I read something that surprised me just recently. Meredith Klein, who wrote By Oath Consigned, has come out with a three-volume set, Kingdom Prologue, which is the beginning of an Old Testament theology that is privately printed. It is available through Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. He does deal with these texts, and he claims that there is a meritorious ground that Abraham's faith here is involved in the promulgation of promise. I find that difficult, but it seems that this is not meritorious. It is the evidence and demonstration of the grace and the work of God in his life. You have to be careful how you formulate things like that, because you are putting yourself into a hypothetical kind of situation that tries to separate theoretically things that we cannot separate. In other words, you are into this whole thing of divine sovereignty and human responsibility and election, and God's sovereignty in relation to that. Quote, those who were chosen in Christ before the formation of the world, end quote. Could they ever be lost? Well, in one sense, you can say, if they do not respond to the gospel, they will be lost, yes. But in another sense, you could say, they cannot be lost, they are in Christ, who is the foundation of the world. They are going to respond to the gospel. How you unravel all that is very difficult. At a certain point, you are better to stand back and let the statements of Scripture, with respect to issues of that sort, stand on their own, without trying to dissect them to the point where you can logically lay everything out and explain it. It seems to me that there are points you can't fully understand or explain. When you try to do that, you usually fall into distorting one side over the other side. Of course, then you could ask, quote, do you have a basic contradiction? End quote. I would say, no. There are people who say there is a contradiction between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. But I am not, at the same time, saying I can explain exactly how it works. You can't, because there's a fundamental contradiction there. You are in an area of mystery. It is similar to the two natures of Christ. In one person there was God and man, two natures, one person. You know you can say that, but how do you explain that? It is quite difficult. You can explain what it is not, like the Christological formulation, it is not this, it is not that, it is not something else. Similarly, when you get into the question of the inspiration of Scripture and the divine and human elements in the composition of Scripture, it is both. But at the same time, it is God's Word. We talk about an organic view of inspiration, which includes the person, their education, and their background, which often comes through, yet that in no way detracts from Scripture's divine character. It is the Word of God. How do you explain that? I do not think you can fully explain it, but there is that interaction of divine and human. It seems that at this point, you have to kind of step back a little bit. There is not any necessary conclusion 
that is meritorious in Genesis chapter 22. But there is a connection. Because you've done this, here are these promises. He has worked those conditions in Abraham so that that is part of the whole promulgation of the promise. That he would do those things, but that is just a suggestion. We are talking about Abraham as our spiritual father. We looked at these four passages that speak of the Abrahamic covenant. God's covenant with Abraham is in Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 through 14. We have already looked at the earlier part of chapter 17, but let's go back and look at verses 9 through 14. We read there, quote, And God said unto Abraham, You shall keep my covenant, therefore, you and your seed after you and their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep, between me and you and your seed after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every male child in your generations he that is born in the house, or bought with money, or of any foreigner, which is not of your seed, he that is born in your house, and he that is bought with your money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh, for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant." End quote. So with God's promise to Abraham came an obligation on his part and on that of his seed. Circumcision is to become a token or a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham, which you read in verse 11, quote, You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you, end quote. We find that Abraham had to circumcise himself in verse 11 and then every male child in his household, and not just his own children, but everyone who is under his authority, including slaves. Then the striking statement in verse 14, which says, not to do that was to break the covenant, quote, and the uncircumcised male child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant, end quote. So circumcision was taken very seriously. You find later, when Moses neglected the rite of circumcision, how seriously the Lord took it. When Moses was returning to Egypt in Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 through 25, and it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Quote, surely a bloody husband you are to me, end quote. So the Lord let him go, end quote. It seems that the issue was that Moses had not circumcised his son, and the Lord threatened his life because he had not done so. The consequence for neglect, as stated in chapter 17, is, quote, that the soul shall be cut off from his people, end quote. That is in the context of the Feast of Unleavened Bread in Exodus chapter 12, verses 15 through 19. Quote, Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put leaven out of your houses. For whosoever shall eat unleavened bread from the first day unto the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. End quote. There you have not only a connection with circumcision, but also with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was associated with Passover. If that is violated, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. There is some discussion as to what that means, to, quote, be cut off from his people, end quote, or to, quote, be cut off from Israel, end quote. Does that mean this person will be executed? Does that mean death? Or does it mean excommunication? Commentators are divided on that. Exodus chapter 31, verse 14 says, quote, you shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defiles it shall be surely put to death. For whoever does any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Quote. There the parallel suggests that, quote, 
to be cut off from among his people, end quote, means death. If you apply that to these other passages, to the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Circumcision, you still do not know who is to administer that punishment. Is the Lord saying he will in some way do it? Or is it the responsibility of the community? That is not spelled out. But the sanction that is included with the command to circumcise emphasizes the, the seriousness with which God intended this to be taken. Circumcision as a rite was practiced among other people, even prior to Abraham's time. That is not something that originated in Genesis 17 when the command was given to Abraham. It did not originate with Israel, but it originated at that point as a sign of God's covenant with Abraham. Circumcision was not something that was unknown among other peoples, so God gives it to Abraham with a new and special significance. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 25, quote, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all who are circumcised only in the flesh, Egypt, Judah, Edom, Ammon, and Moab, and all who live in the desert in desert places. For these nations are really uncircumcised, and even the whole house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. End quote. That passage demonstrates how circumcision was not something that was unique to Israel. The Egyptians did it, the Edomites did it, the Ammonites did it, and the Moabites did it. It is well known that other peoples practice circumcision. However, what Jeremiah is talking about here is that even though some of the Israelites are circumcised outwardly, they are not really, in the true sense of the word, circumcised. This introduction of the rite is found in connection with the Abrahamic covenant. It has significance as a sign of the covenant and points to the need for internal cleansing. In other words, most feel that the basic idea of circumcision is the removal of uncleanness, that is, the symbolism involved. The ritual points to the need for internal cleansing. Sin is a matter of race. It is something that is passed on from generation to generation. The uncleanness of sin must be taken away. Physical descent from Abraham is not sufficient to make one true child of God. There has to be that internal cleansing. So circumcision becomes an outward sign of what must take place internally. Circumcision of the heart. That idea of circumcision of the heart is also rooted in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 16 says, quote, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and awesome one, which regards not persons, nor takes reward. End quote. And Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6 says, quote, The Lord your God will circumcise your heart, and the heart of your seed, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, that you may live. End quote. If you go over to the New Testament, you find in Romans 4, Paul discusses circumcision, beginning in Romans chapter 4, verse 8. Quote, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Comes this blessedness upon circumcision only, or upon uncircumcision also? For his faith, was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness, end quote. Faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness, but before he was circumcised. Quote, How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision, end quote. Romans chapter 4, verse 10. And then verse 11 tells what circumcision really is. Quote, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness may be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised, end quote. 
So nobody is saved by circumcision, whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. If you follow the analogy of circumcision by baptism when it is applied to infants. But it is a sign of the covenant, and as such it is to be passed to the children. The important thing is not just the sign itself, but the faith in the provision that God would make for the cleansing of the individual. Let's go on to the high point of Abraham's faith in Genesis chapter 22, when God tests Abraham. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 says, quote, Sometime later God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. End quote. I read from the NIV, which is certainly a better translation of Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, than the King James Version. The King James Version says, quote, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am I. End quote. The original King James says, quote, God did tempt Abraham, end quote, which can be confusing. Quote, test, end quote, is a much better translation of that word. It says in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, quote, God tempts no man. Man is tempted when he is led astray by his own desires, end quote. God tests a man, but he does not tempt a man. Satan tempts. Satan brings experiences into life that are designed to draw you away from the Lord. God does not do that. He can bring things into your life that can test your faith, but the intent is to strengthen. In a particular sense, that is the problem that you face every day in your own experiences. If you think of Job, he lost his family and possessions. That was a temptation from Satan, because Satan had come to the Lord and said, Look, this man you've said is a righteous man. Let me do these things to him, and you'll find he's going to fall. And the Lord said, All right, within certain limits you can do certain things. And Satan came in there with an attempt to draw him away from the Lord. He did not succeed at that. We know that that is what was going on, because we can read the text. Job did not know that Satan had come in there before the heavenly court and requested permission to do that. You can apply that to your own experiences. You can have a bad experience and say, quote, What's going on? Is this Satan at work to draw me away from the Lord? Has he initiated it? End quote. Well, maybe he has. Or it could be the Lord at work to attempt to strengthen you and to confirm you in your faith. I think the Lord is always at work, and so maybe both are at work. But you cannot really know in any given incident why that has been initiated in your life, whether it is primarily coming from Satan or whether it is something the Lord has initiated. Here it is to test and strengthen Abraham's faith. It was an extremely severe test. Here is a battle going on in the unseen world between the Lord and Satan. That battleground is in our own lives and in our own experiences. So how we respond to those things is significant and important. We should respond to trials by seeking God's strength and praying for grace no matter what the situation. But I think that is helpful to know in the struggles of life. Calvin again has made some helpful comments here about this test of Abraham. On page 563, he says of Abraham, quote, His mind must have been severely crushed and violently agitated when the command and the promise of God were conflicting within it. End quote. So here's the promise. There is Isaac, Abraham's son, who is the fulfillment of the promise which God had confirmed. His seed is not going to be Ishmael. It is going to be through Isaac. These promises have been confirmed over and over, and now God comes and says to slay that son, who is the child of the promise. 
Calvin says, quote, The command and the promise seemed to conflict. But when he had come to the conclusion that God, with whom he knew he had to do, could not be his adversary, although he did not immediately discover how the contradiction might be removed, he nevertheless, by hope, reconciled the command with the promise. Because being persuaded that God was faithful, he left the unknown issue to divine providence. Meanwhile, as with closed eyes, he goes where he is directed. The truth of God deserves this honor. Not only that, it should far transcend all human means, so that it alone, even without me, shall suffice this, but also that it shall surmount all obstacles. It was difficult and painful for Abraham to forget that he was the father and a husband, and to cast off all his human affections, and to endure before the world the disgrace and shame cruelty by becoming the executioner of his son. But the other was far more severe and horrible thing, namely that he conceived God to contradict himself in his word, and then that supposes the hope of the promised blessing to be cut off from him when Isaac is torn away from amazing grace. We know from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, that this was an act of faith by Abraham. He proceeded to what God had commanded him to do. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, to whom it was said, In Isaac shall your seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. The test here is the test of Abraham's faith. Dr. Robert Vinoy, Old Testament History, Lecture Number 23